This is Making a Scientist, the podcast by young scientists for young scientists, featuring cutting edge science and all of the life and work advice that you'll ever need to succeed. It's brought alive by brilliant scientists and it's hosted by me, Alex Ainsco. What is it like to be a clinical academic researcher? Well, this week, my guest is Professor Justin Mason, who's a professor of vascular rheumatology at Imperial College London. Justin is an incredibly distinguished academic who runs both a highly successful research group and a large vessel vasculitis clinic at Hammersmith Hospital. This week is a really brilliant episode featuring an overview of Justin's cutting edge research, some amazing personal stories from throughout his career, and of course, some fantastic advice for early career researchers. We really do dive deep and discuss a lot, including how he first became interested in immunology as a junior doctor, his research aims in rheumatology, and some incredible stories of how he conducted his research in Africa and London, which features radioactive pigs and some unorthodox but very effective methods of storing and shipping samples back to London. I can't wait to share these amazing stories with you all. So without any further ado, let's begin. Professor Justin Mason, Justin, thank you very much for giving up your time today. I'd like to start, if I may, by asking you about the area of research that you work in. Yeah, so I, I guess I work in vascular biology, really. So I'm interested in the, in the, in the vasculature. Um, and particular aspect of that is the impact of systemic inflammation on it, and particularly systemic inflammatory disease. So how do relatively common diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus erythematosus, but also rarer diseases such as vasculitis, impact on the vasculature, but particularly the endothelium, which is my area of interest. And the reason I became interested in that is because, one, I'm a rheumatologist, and two, it relates to premature cardiovascular disease in young people. So what made you get interested in blood vessels in the, in the first instance? Yeah, well, so when I was at medical school, I got particularly interested in immunology. Um, and that okay. led me ultimately to be a rheumatologist. Um, and then when I was doing my sort of early rheumatology training, I began to look around for PhD possibilities. And I went to see various um, PIs at the time. And I met uh, Professor Doran Hasgard, who was particularly interested um, mm-hmm. in leukocyte trafficking uh, and the endothelium and I thought this fits many of my interests links between immunology inflammation and the clinical discipline so that's really what got me interested into it into the area oh so so it was fortuitous I suppose like uh, the opportunity came in yeah it was fortuitous um, because we'd we'd not met before we just happened to be working in the same place (laughs) so um so what are the uh, what are your research interests you mentioned you mentioned rheumatology but um what what and kind of specifically do you are you interested in researching so I have two areas really the the basic science research which is looking at endothelial biology uh, and particularly ways in which the endothelium can be injured and the innate pathways that protect our endothelium in all of us with the ultimate aim of therapeutically enhancing those so they may be regulated by okay. signaling kinases such as protein kinase C epsilon or AMP kinase um, and, and so I'm very interested in the, the links between them and protection against inflammation. The other aspect that has become more important in recent years has been much more clinically related research uh, on patients and that divides into looking at circulating endothelial um, cell colony forming cells derived from patient blood so to try and get a, a handle on the endothelium in vivo and then imaging uh, of the vasculature and inflammation, looking at novel imaging strategies in large vessel vasculitis. Just for our listeners, would you be able to explain um, sort of how your research is going to have a, a wider impact on society and indeed the rest of the world? Yeah, so I think if we understand the endothelium, so all of us sitting here or listening t- to this podcast will experience endothelial dysfunction. After we, for example, clean our teeth in the morning, if you vigorously clean your teeth, you release bacteria from the gums. And then if, oh, you, wow. measure, if you measure endothelial function using a, a cuff on the arm, like a blood pressure cuff, you will see that it dips. During that time, you clear the bacteria and it settles down. So if we can really understand those mechanisms and know how that can injure people over time. So if you have rheumatoid arthritis, then your endothelium is dysfunctional all the time. And so how can we reverse that process? And this process is directly linked in all of us to the development of atherosclerotic plaque and ultimately to myocardial infarction and stroke. 
So I think um, by really understanding endothelial dysfunction, how it might be reversed by drugs such as statins, for example, then mm-hmm. we can begin to alter the outlook for patients um, over, over many years. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is much more disease orientated. So the imaging, we see a lot of young patients, by which I mean people in their 20s and 30s, with damage to large blood vessels like the aorta or the blood vessels to the brain, to the kidneys. Mm. Um, so how do they get damaged? Well, it's through a, um, um, vasculitis, so inflammation. Mm-hmm. Now, why that kicks off, we don't know. We think it's probably a combination of environmental factors with genetic predisposition. Um, okay. And, you know, we have occasionally seen it, for example, in patients with COVID-19. So that ties in oh. a long thought of link between viral infection and vasculitis. Now, all of us get viral infections, but very few of us get vasculitis. So there's obviously some other element. So these, and what happens to these vessels and these young people is that they narrow down, they scar down, so that restricts blood supply to the organs. So by developing imaging, metabolic imaging strategies and better use of imaging, we can diagnose the disease earlier and then treat it more effectively. I see. Fantastic. That's incredible. So uh, are a lot of these diseases that you're interested in more common in, uh, in, in people who are older? Well, no, fun enough, that in large vessel vasculitis, there's two predominant diseases. One that affects a young age group, so mm-hmm. can be in children, but in predominantly in adults less than 40 years of age. And then the other condition is called giant cell arteritis. That's much more common over 60 and then in- increasingly common as one gets older. Um, and there are some similarities between the two, but there are also differences between the two. Um, right. And of course... Um, think there are rare diseases such as Kawasaki disease that affects children. So it can affect any age group, these conditions. Our next section is called When You Were Young. So, Justin, um, would you mind telling us where did you grow up and, and where are you from? Not at all. So I grew up in uh, suburban Surrey, so about okay. um, nothing glamorous, about thirty miles south, you are southeast of London, uh, in, a, okay. in what was then a small town called Camberley. It's now a larger town, uh, commuter town. Uh, my father was a general practitioner, and my mother was a physiotherapist. So okay. that's where I was brought up, um, and we had fun there. It was good. I enjoyed it. We had yeah. good. And it was my first exposure, obviously, to medicine and um, medical things. So um, yeah, definitely. So with your dad being a, a doctor, did you get um, uh, much exposure to the the work that he did? Because uh, it was either general practitioner for the for the local town for Cambridge. Yeah. So in those days, yeah. you know, if you were a general practitioner, you really were. The, you know, local and on the spots, mm. even so that mm. um, to the extent that when my sisters and I used to walk around Camberley Town Centre, we used to be recognised by his patients. So <laughs> we sort of lived with his job because that's how GPs worked in those days. You know, the telephone was ringing all the time. It wasn't until I was around, I don't know, 10 years of age before he even got any sort of remote bleeper or anything so that he could leave the house. Uh, we even had a, a telephone bell on the outside of the house. So if he was in the garden, he could hear the phone ringing. And of course, when when he went out on visits, which he used to do often in the middle of the night, putting his suit on over his pajamas, which was a sight sight for sore eyes, then my mum then used to have to take the calls because once he was out seeing patients, uh, he wasn't Mm. contactable. Um, So he used to ring in from the patient's house to my mum to see if there'd been any further calls or whether he could come home at that point. Oh, wow. So house calls, that's, um, I mean, uh, so I'm not a, um, a medical doctor. Are house calls uh, a common thing nowadays? I no, know. I think they've more or less disappeared. I mean, I think they do mm. occur for people who are, you know, maybe uh, housebound or even dying at home with a family, you know, then things, then the GPs will go and do house calls. But, uh, you know, then they were a routine part of, of daily life as a GP. Uh, but mm-hmm. now they're you know extremely rare. I think to be honest. I mean, yeah. sure, at the weekend if you call one one one, you know a GP may be sent round, but that's a slightly different thing to your own GP coming round. 
Yeah, definitely. The community feel is, um, uh, I don't know, it's sort of evaporating, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, in a sense, yeah. Um, so with your with your mum, what sort of what sort of physiotherapy did she do? So she was interested particularly in patients who'd had knee replacements. And bearing in mind this was the sort of mm-hmm. late seventies, uh, early eighties. You know, knee replacement surgery was fairly rudimentary. Uh, but she worked in a local hospital and she did particularly hydrotherapy to help people recover from knee replacements. Oh, and wow. she was the ideal physio because she's very good at bossing people around and getting them, <laughs> getting them going in the nicest possible way. She was She wouldn't allow any slacking. Uh, so. Fair enough. Um, so when you so um, for those listeners who are unaware, so Justin is a is a medical doctor as well as a, a professor. Um, so how did you, how did you get here? What did you what did you study firstly as an undergraduate? Yeah, so I was I particularly interested in medicine from my um, seeing what my father did. My two sisters, I should add, thought medicine was the last thing that they were going to do because it dominated oh, really? so much of our childhood. So I think you either went one way or the other. It wasn't, it wasn't anything in between. So, <laughs> so just, just of interest, what did your sisters go in? So my one sister went on to do uh, PPE. Uh, and okay. the the other one um, studied at Exeter University, did religious studies, and then went into HR and HR management. And, and she's oh, wow. now a, she's now a careers advisor in a sixth form college. So, sort of different <laughs> things. Yeah, different things. Yeah, crazy. So, um, so yeah, so so for yourself, you were very interested in medicine. Yeah. So I went on to go to a medical school, a London medical school at Charing Cross Hospital, mm-hmm. as it was then. Then it merged with. Chelsea and Westminster and of course it's now become Imperial College Medical School but in those days it was Charing Cross Hospital Medical School uh, yeah. in London which you know I really enjoyed I think the reason I went there was because my father's old professor when he was a houseman uh, had become um, professor of medicine I think or professor of surgery at Charing Cross so that's the sort of link that we had but um, yeah mm. so that's that's where I studied medicine. Okay so um so you were at Charing Cross for uh, how long is a medical degree? Five years? Well, I, yeah, degree? I did six years because I took a year in the six middle years. to do a BSc degree. So I did six okay. years there. Yeah. Oh, and what was your BSc degree in? So um, I did immunology and biochemistry. Um, and I, wo- okay. I so that was mainly um, lectures and things. But then I did uh, projects at the Kennedy Institute of Rheumatology and also with um, Professor Ivan Roy at the immunology department in at the Middlesex Hospital. So I really enjoyed those. And that's really what turned me to do rheumatology in the longer term. Oh, I see. Yeah, I think so. Like, it's an early influence, isn't it? And then later, I mean, we'll come on to later how you how you did your PhD and everything. But yeah, I'm, I'm starting to see how this has fallen into place now. <laughs> um, so, uh, so you graduated from your, your medical degree. Um, what did you do uh, after, you, after you graduated? So in those days, and it's not dissimilar now, you did two six-month jobs as, as, as a houseman which is a bit pretty okay. sort of daunting prospect. So the first six months I did at Charing Cross Hospital, um, and you're literally, you would re- literally, you know, one day you're a medical student, next day you're a doctor on the ward. Um, and particularly- <laughs> Throw, week, Thrown in right in the deep Thrown end. right in, <laughs> particularly your first weekend on call, you know, you're thinking, am I gonna cope? So I did six <laughs> months in London, then I did six months as a surgical houseman down at um, Windsor Hospital, which was completely different, small hospital, um, there were just three surgical housemen. I worked for a delightful urologist who, and my role was, was basically standing in the theatre, holding on to metal instruments, or occasionally just standing beside him while he used a telescopic thing. So I was completely redundant, <laughs> except occasionally if it rained, he'd send me out to, to shut the roof of the, his car, which was a soft top Mercedes. <laughs> so it was a particularly oh. responsible role I had in those days. Uh, but I really enjoyed the whole experience down there. It was great. So it's sort of, it's like, you know, it was a small family, a small district general hospital. I learned a huge amount doing that. So uh, did you, have you ever lived in any other countries other than, um, other than London? Because um, I'm understanding that you, uh, you lived on, in, in a suburb of London and then you came to, um, you came to do your, your degree here. Have, have you lived anywhere else? Not really. I spent three months in Africa um, during my medical okay. school, which we can come on later on, but which I really enjoyed. Mm-hmm. And then... I had a, I very nearly went to the States after my PhD, which is might be something we want to discuss later on because it's always a big yeah. decision. So I was going to go to Boston uh, in the US, but then mm-hmm. the job I was always hoping to get in London came up much earlier than I'd in, 
anticipated. So that changed my plans at the last moment. Um, okay. Yeah, but uh, I can tell you more about that later, maybe. I can't, can't wait. <laughs> um, so uh, I suppose we, we may have already answered this question already, but did you, um, did you always picture yourself in this career path or did you ever consider any others? So when I was young, um, sort of, you know, before I became a sort of teenager, I guess, I always wanted to be an African game warden. That was my, that's what I was going to do. And I had a friend whose name I won't give you, but a friend who had very similar interest to me. Um, and I went on to be a doctor and he went on to be an African game warden. <laughs> he oh, actually wow. did it in Botswana. <laughs> so that's what I always uh, imagined I would do. And then I suppose I realised that coming from Surrey, the chances of being a successful African game warden were relatively limited. So then yeah. I became more interested in medicine after that. Fair enough. Could you talk us through uh, the the application for your PhD? So you you mentioned after your uh, after your medical degree, you then uh, you do your you did your two years as a, a houseman, which I think a, a senior house officer perhaps it's called now. That's yep. Yeah. So um so after you you'd, you'd done these two uh, these two years, uh, what did you do then, and how where, how does the PhD come into the story? Yeah. So after uh, the first two jobs, then I did a rotation. I used to rotate jobs every six months. So I well I did a year at the Whittington Hospital, North London. Then I did a year. Then I did six months at the Royal Brompton Hospital six months at Hammersmith Hospital and then six months at the London Chest Hospital in Bethnal Green. And then I got onto a registrar rotation. Um, So then I went down to Slough to Wexham Park Hospital for a year and I did general medicine and renal medicine and uh, respiratory medicine um, and acute medicine. And then I came the second year, I seem to be there all the time. um, the, The second year I came back to Hammersmith to do rheumatology. And so it was during that time. Well, in fact, In fact, it was a little bit before that. So when I was down at Wexham Park Hospital, running around the wards doing general medicine, I got a message from the secretary, because of course we didn't have mobile phones, that uh, (laughs) Professor Sir Colin Dollery wanted to see me. He was the professor of medicine here at the Hammersmith. So of course I had a complete fit thinking, you know, what have I done wrong? (laughs) Anyway, I drove up to the Hammersmith Hospital to go and see him. And he, he sadly died this year at a good age, but he called me into his office and he said, right, I, I want to know what your research plans are. And he took a real interest in all of us on that rotation, trying to help guide us into research. And he, have you read this immunology article in Science magazine this week? Well, I had to explain to him that the Wexham Park Hospital Library, which is about the size of my office, didn't stop (laughs) science. So I hadn't actually read it. So that's when I, and he he gave me some advice. And then when I came back to Hammersmith the following year, I, I started to go around seeing various people looking at potential research opportunities mm. found something so, so to, mm, w- was this a typical thing um that, that doctors would look at doing research or was it was it that um that, that this mentor was was really pushing you towards it it was I, i'm wondering if it's yeah if, yeah if no, it's moment. a very good question now. so i think because i've become interested in doing my bsc in doing research i i specifically look for jobs where they would encourage you to do time out and research so the Hammersmith okay. and Royal Postgraduate Medical School, as it was then, was very keen on people doing research. So that you didn't have to do it, but that's what I always wanted to do. So I slightly selected it on that basis. Okay. Um, and then when I found something I was interested in doing, Professor Hasgard and I wrote a, an MRC uh, clinical research training fellowship application. Okay. So how did you meet Professor Hasgard? Well, he was, he'd moved from Guy's Hospital about the just I think just before I started at Hammersmith as a registrar and so the, I went to see him I went to see Professor Mark Walport and um, there was Alexander So was here I went back to see uh, Professor Manian Venables at the Kennedy Institute uh, I went to see a PhD um, possibility with Professor Tim Evans down at the Royal Brompton and I just sort of tried to get a feel for what was out there and then I particularly was attracted by what Professor Haskard's research area was. Um, so th- I asked if mm-hmm. I could join his lab. Yeah. Oh, OK. So, yeah, no, that's um, yeah, we'll get onto this in the advice section in a second. But it sounds like you really, yeah, you shopped around and you, 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 you uh, made a real informed decision about, about PhDs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was your PhD actually about? Yeah, so the first part of the project was actually to try and generate new monoclonal antibodies against activated endothelium because it was at the time where adhesion molecules were particularly emerging 
and um, Doran Haskell had some data suggesting that the the adhesion molecules that had been described um, didn't, you know, they, the, that there were others out there that hadn't been discovered. So we tried, we tried to set up um, activated endothelium in different ways and then made our own monoclonal antibodies. And in fact, we generated a lot of monoclonal antibodies, but the vast majority were against ICAM-1, which had already been discovered. So uh, we didn't actually find in that first year an antibody that we thought was going to be novel. So we, I slightly shifted TAC um, because I've become particularly interested in a molecule called Thi-1. So I began to look at other endothelial activation um, markers and the difference between large vessel and small vessel endothelium. So that's really what my PhD is about. It's about um, endothelial heterogeneity in different vascular beds. And I developed techniques for culturing microvascular endothelium. Nowadays, you buy them from Promacel, but I harvest yeah. them myself and culture them from skin. And we wow. did all sorts of work to study the heterogeneity and responsiveness. Oh, wow. And um, did you have any particular major findings from those studies? Yeah, we, we found that Thi-1 was, was a, a, an activation antigen on the vascular endothelium, particularly in the microvasculature. And when ligated, it would send specific signals, calcium signaling pathways to the, to the vascular endothelium. And we also identified that protein kinase C was a particularly important signaling kinase that regulated different responses in large vessels and small vessels. So, oh, and I see that's yeah, that's shaped your research uh, going forward, hasn't it? Like, yeah. So, for for the listeners who don't know, I was um, I think it's nearly five or six years ago now. I was a, I was a master student um, under the supervision of uh, of Justin, and I worked on on PKC as well. So I know that um, PKC is a huge interest of yours, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of like awesome research that has, has come out of, of of the PKC project. So that's really cool. Um, uh, so after you, after you'd done your PhD. Uh, what did you do then? So then that, that was quite an important time for me because what I really wanted to do was to go uh, out and, and do a postdoctoral position in the States, which I alluded to earlier on. So I'd got in touch yeah. with um, someone at Harvard Medical School who'd um, agreed that we'd write a, uh, an application together. So while I was doing that, I'd gone back onto the wards to complete my medical training. And I had a great friend at the time who was... Um, in full-time clinical here and they were quite um, junior they were senior registrar but quite early so it looked like they would be in that role for another two or three years so I thought perfect I'll go out to Boston for two or three years and then I'll come back hopefully into this job but as it happened they were so good this particular person that they got made a consultant two or three years early and suddenly the job came available in six months so I had this very difficult decision, which I agonised over, and I still don't know whether I made the right decision or not. Do I go to take this postdoc on and then mm. gamble and see if I can find my way back into a job I want? Or do I take the job I'd always hoped I'd get and continue my research <laughs> that way? So in the end, after n- nagging God knows how many people for advice, I ultimately stayed and went for this job, which I luckily got. And mm. then I then wrote an intermediate fellowship um, within that job and I managed to get an AR um, an arthritis research campaign intermediate fellowship and then subsequently a senior fellowship oh wow okay um so I suppose I'd like to just close this section out by uh, talking about the advice that you would give to young people but at different stages in their career so what what would you say to the people who are um you know either thinking about uh, taking on a university course so entering into an undergraduate degree and um, they're either finishing their undergraduate degrees and thinking then about postgraduate degrees and then people like me who are coming up to the final year in their phd thinking about finishing and then looking for their first post phd positions um is your advice similar for all three or do you have specific tailored advice for yeah i think this, so i think the specific advice so the first thing i think is never do something because you think you should be doing it do something because you want to do it i think there is a t- there's a pressure on people and it can come from all different sources friends parents You know, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. And sometimes that advice is very good. But I certainly wouldn't go and do a university degree if I thought, you know, I don't want to do a university degree. I want to go out into the world and I want to earn some money. I want to develop skills in that way. So that's the first thing. But I think if you're inclined to do a university degree, I couldn't recommend it more highly. I mean, I had a fantastic Mm -hmm. time. And in fact, 
maybe one thing I might change about my university course, and this is no criticism of Charing Cross Hospital, which is fantastic. I think, you know, maybe I would have done medicine in a, you know, that was part of London University, but we were in a medical school, small medical school. Whereas I think there's a lot of advantage being in a bigger university where you interact mm. with people from the arts and people from languages, people doing different types of science. So I think maybe I would have slightly changed that. But yeah, I thought I loved the, my time at university. And I think it's, um, I'd highly recommend it to anyone. If you've got any, you know, there's no rush in life. Luckily, most people can live for a decent length of time and everyone's in a rush to get there. But in fact, you know, you, if you rush through and just think, oh, I can't be bothered with the university, you know, I probably would like to go. Then go, do it for three years. You'll still only be 22 when you come out. Um, and there'll be another 60 years worth with any luck. So um, <laughs> yeah. I think that's good. But only do things that you really think you're going to enjoy. Um, and, you know, if you think yeah. I'd love to do that course, but maybe maybe people would think more of me if I did that course. You do the course that you want to do. And then I think if you enjoy it, um, then, you know, there's no, I think masters are increasingly important if you want an academic career. So I think yeah. masters degrees are great, uh, particularly if um, you want to do something a little bit more specialist in your career. And then, you know, if you then, I think making the decision to go into a PhD is the next really big step because that is a big difference. You know, yes. I think there's a mistake going to a PhD and thinking it's just three more years of undergraduate university because it's, it's not that, as you know yourself. It's, mm. You've got to be more independent. You've got to be very resilient. Um, you've got to be more, um, uh, you know, you've got to be prepared to think and do things of your own volition uh, and help get involved in directing the project. And that can be quite challenging. Plus, you've got to be prepared to go home every Friday with yet another failed experiment and try and pick yourself <laughs> up from Monday morning. So, yeah. but it is terrific. I mean, it's, if, you, if you want to do that sort of thing, then, you know, it's a really big step up from an undergraduate degree and really good fun. Definitely. So what, what considerations would you, would you uh, take um, in addition to what you've said already for, for choosing your, um, your, your PhD program or your, or your first P post PhD position? Because um, so a lot of people, for instance, don't necessarily have to do a PhD in the, in the topic that they studied at undergraduate level. Um, but is, 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 is the key message, I suppose, that you, you should just do, do what you love, do what is, is really yeah, like driving you? Like, uh, yeah, yeah. and think? I think, you know, go and see people. That's what I did. I was advised, go and mm. talk to people. Because most labs are looking for good people. It's difficult to find good people. And so if you're looking for a PhD, go round and talk to the people. Because, you know, a project can look very good and trendy on paper, but when you actually talk to the person about it, it may not actually be what you're interested in. So I think I wouldn't be frightened of making appointments to go and see people and asking if you can see them. Um, I think that's particularly important if you're looking for postdoc jobs and things. Mm -hmm. um, I think moving is always good within reason. So, you know, if you do a PhD in one place, then, you know, it may be that there's a very good project for you to move on in the same place, but actually getting further experience training in another lab yeah. is, is really worthwhile. Going abroad, as you say, if that's feasible from family and other points of view. Mm -hmm. um, but never be frightened to contact the person who's advertising the role and say, can I talk to you about it and find out a bit more about it? Because if they can't be bothered to give you the time to talk about it, then they won't give you the time when you're working for them. So I think that's a good test of them. And, you know, be confident. You know, we're all looking for good people. Um, yeah. And so don't, um, don't be shy. Go out there and say, this is what I'm interested in. You know, can, what can you offer me type of thing? For the next section, what I'd like to do is to discuss about your experiences in science. So this is a section that I'm particularly uh, excited and uh, I, ca I can't wait to hear your responses to, to a lot of these questions. So could you start by telling us what was your most memorable experience in, in science as a whole? I, you know, I think one of the f most memorable things I did was, um, was almost my first ever scientific project. It wasn't quite my first one because I did one in my BSc, which we, which we got published. But then, th thanks to the person I did that with, um, Professor Patrick Venables, I was going out to um, Africa. It would have been about 1985. 
mm-hmm. to work for three months in a hospital north of Nairobi, sort of 25 kilometres, maybe 30 kilometres. And we oh, decided wow. we would do a project where we would collect blood samples to look for a variety of uh, infectious agents, but including what was then called HTLV3, and which is now, of course, known as HIV. So to cut a long story mm-hmm. short, we collected a quite a lot. This is my, a friend of mine, Rob Bruce and myself. We collected, I guess, 200 samples, uh, which we brought back. And through the MRC Centre at the Northwick Park, we, we tested them for various things. And we found that about 1% of the population at that point had evidence for HIV infection. Whereas in Nairobi, a study published a couple of months before had shown much higher rates than that. So we published a short article in the New England Journal of Medicine saying that this, the spread of this new virus was potentially, mm-hmm. could be protected if things were done and stepped in at the time. So this got a much higher profile publication than we expected because it followed a big, a big study in Nairobi, in the centre of Nairobi, where they'd looked at medical students and they'd looked at sex workers and showed an alarming rate of high percentage. Um, but anyway, it didn't go down well with the Kenyan government, who, um, who were denying at the time that there was any AIDS in Africa, because, of course, it had a terrible impact on the tourist industry. So particularly the one, the senior author got who was working out there, got sort of became persona non grata for a while. But for me, it was a really important moment because I suddenly really got the research bug. You know, I thought, wow, you know, I can do stuff and we can get it published. So that was a, a, a real highlight for me. And then I guess other things are like your first senior author paper, I think, is good highlight. Your first PhD student who's successful those are sort of the things that, for me, are the highlights of science or people who work for you who go on to get their first permanent job or their first fellowship mm. and things like that. So those are the sort of highlights, I think, for me, rather than particular findings. Um, OK, yeah. So more about people um, and, and the impact that it's had, definitely. OK. Um, so was that, um, was that when you were a medical student or was this when you were, um, you were a house officer? No, it's in my, uh, it, well, it's the sort of, I think we went in the fourth or fifth year. So the sort of year before you did the finals the following summer. Yeah. So I was a sort of senior medical student and we worked in this incredible hospital. It's a tiny little hospital, but there were, we met some really nice people there and the local doctors were absolutely incredible and the patients were even more amazing. I mean, they used to walk for miles to get to this hospital and if they couldn't be seen they'd just camp out in the grounds and wait patiently the next day they could you know a few of our patients in the uk or a few of us in the uk could take some lessons from them about patients and (laughs) how to behave you know they were amazing and some of them were really sick you know and we were given quite a bit of responsibility because they were very short staffed and Mm. we used to commute in by hitching a lift and People got to recognise us and we used to get in the back with the chickens and the mealy meal sacks <laughs> in the back of the open top trucks and it was a hilarious time. It was great. They were such lovely people. It's amazing. <laughs> so um, what was, um, so the, the hospitals themselves, um, uh, I don't know if, um, if you uh, had a, a story about the, um, the, the storage of samples that you were... Um, yeah, I mean, of course, we did this project. I mean, now I think about it. I mean, we'd never be allowed to do it now. <laughs> I mean, it went from it went from completely bonkers to absolutely catastrophically crazy. But we so we started by taking most of the stuff with us. So we just had our luggage full of syringes and needles. And I mean, mm-hmm. I, goodness knows what anyone would think now if you pitched up to Heathrow with 150 syringes Gosh. and needles. So we took all of that. We got to the hospital. We had no idea whether we could do this project. So then we managed to get some. We met up with this guy in Nairobi. I can't think even how we introduced him. Anyway, he gave us some advice. Then we were going around this tiny little hospital in Kiambu and we found a centrifuge. I mean, why there was a centrifuge? Anyway, there was a little bench top centrifuge. So we could, we could spin the samples down to keep the serum. Then we had to, we'd made friends with some people who live locally who very kindly were putting us up. So we had to store the samples in their deep freeze. Um, because the hospital doesn't have any freezer capacity. And then we put the samples in cool bags and then in our luggage on the way home on the airline. I mean, no one asked anything. And of course, they were then at minus 50, presumably, whatever it is in the hold of an aircraft, you know, underneath. 
they were all still frozen when we got them back and then we took them put them in my wow. mother's deep freeze and then eventually <laughs> transported them to the MRC centre and bearing in mind quite a few of them had hepatitis B and syphilis and <laughs> I mean, oh, God. beggar's belief, really. <laughs> but you just, in yeah. those days, you know, you, you, I think we consented the patients, but there was mm. no formal ethics or anything. Um, and, that, you know, I think about it. And, you know, the hepatitis B vaccine was just available. So we'd had the first dose before we went, but we had to take the second two doses in a thermos flask. Me and the guy went with him. We injected each other for the second and third doses while we were there. Um, so we because you know they, the the medical school were concerned that we might get cross infected I guess would it be but it was an incredible experience and it just shows what you can do if you put your mind to it and you get a bit of luck and some people to help you yeah t- uh, definitely so there's now one story that you told me quite a while ago but I've always like found it hilarious whenever I've uh, I've thought about it um so there, there's uh, there's a project that was going on at Hammersmith at some time. And it involved um, radioactive isotopes or radioactive tracers um, and, and some, some animal experiments. So I, I wonder if you wouldn't mind uh, sharing this story with, the, with, with everybody. So this was a project that I was roped in to be um, a sort of willing helper. I had two, <laughs> two colleagues over from New Zealand doing PhDs um, who, would, who were excellent. And... Um, Prof Haskell was doing this extremely interesting work where he was looking for evidence of um, in vivo evidence of endothelial inflammation. And the way that they were doing that was by generating monoclonal antibodies that were then radioactively tagged. And then they would inject uh, the animal with um, cytokines and they would look to see patterns of vas- differential vascular bed inflammation using radio-labeled monoclonals. So you could look at the microvasculature for, you'd, they'd paint something on the skin to increase permeability. Um, and so then and there'd be inflammation in the local vessels, and then they could cut that area of skin out and measure the radioactivity. But yeah. because they, they wanted to do this, because the antibodies they had, and it was in, done in collaboration with a, with a commercial organisation, this was done on mini pigs, um, which were, you know, the most delightful animals. And it was not traumatic for them, but it was so rudimentary then in those days in terms of what facilities were available. So the, um, where the um, radioactive samples could be read and the skin could be sampled was quite a distance away from the um, animal facility. So we used to have to <laughs> move these... Uh, sedated uh, animals around the premises in trolleys and it was all intermingled with the hospital and you know it's just how things were set up in those days so it's not to wow. say that the home office procedures were not tight because they were really tight but it was the mm. it was the actual facilities and so wheeling a, um, a sedated pig covered in a trolley past the main hospital library and down the corridor was it caused us huge anxiety. So we used to go as a group to sort of give ourselves moral, um, you know, moral support for these. Uh, but I mean, the data was, you know, these, they published a whole string of very interesting papers in the Journal of Immunology, which was a, you know, a big journal in those days. So did they carry a, um, a warning sign when you were, when, with, like a, a cloth co- with, that was covering these animals? As, as no, as it was completely no. disguised um, so that nobody knew what <laughs> on earth was in there. Um, and, you know, it wasn't that we were doing anything that wasn't allowed, but it was just, you know, alarming for people. Because, you know, all of these things had gone through ethics and everything else. But we used to get very nervous about uh, the whole thing going wrong. Mm. So what did you do with the... Um because obviously these are these these would be radioactive samples. What did you do with the samples after the experiment? Oh, that was also a problem because the half life of some of those um, radionucleotides was long years. So there used to be a huge freezer out in in the back car park in a sort of fenced off area, and all the tissue used to have to be put in there while the half life, which and some of them was I think nearly five years, before they could be disp- could be disposed of. So, I mean, and we all used to have to wear these radioactive badges. I mean, I can't believe it did anybody any good. So I'm glad to say most of these radioactive procedures are now been replaced by things that are much more, one, safe, two, doable. Yeah. But yeah, so I think, I think one, of the half, one of them had an eight-year 
half-life. So I think you had to store it for four years or maybe five years before you were allowed to dispose of it. Wow. <laughs> of course, most of the people had left by then. You know, you'd done the PhD and gone. So it yeah. had to be recorded and kept. And, oh, it was a nightmare. So what about everyone at the hospital? Were they aware of, of this or was it just sort of like a, an urban legend? Of, of sort of stuff? Yeah, I think increasingly like people got to know about it because, of course, we yeah. presented it at meetings and things. And it was, it was, you know, they did some really nice work. They were looking at differential responses in, in response to tuberculosis and in response to uric crystals. And they showed different patterns of inflammation. So mm-hmm. I think it was, you know, one of the things that an understanding of all of this cytokine biology was of course what led eventually to the um, work at Charing Cross targeting anti-TNF and now all the biologic therapies that we use you know we've, we've got so used to using you know in patients anti-IL-1 anti-IL-6 anti-TNF yeah. IL-12 23 and you know so th- this was the basic biology from our group but lots of other groups around the world that has facilitated this type of treatment for patients ultimately oh wow okay um Next question. What was the biggest challenge that you faced as a student? I think changing my PhD really quite substantially at the end of the first year. So I'd sort of got to the end mm-hmm. of my first year. I'd made a whole load of monoclonal antibodies, but actually not achieved what I was hoping to do. So the question was, did I redo that whole year again, try slightly altering the stimulation, see if I could find this new uh, molecule or did I slightly change tack and, and, and do a more molecule focused approach so that was a big decision which sort of well certainly seemed to have worked out you never quite know do you so that no. was then I think the other big decision was after my PhD when I was trying to get an intermediate fellowship mm-hmm. which is not easy for anyone who's gone for one you know I didn't get an intermediate fellowship first time you've got to get used to being turned down So then the question was, you know, was I just making my life difficult by wanting to be a clinical scientist? You know, I could, why didn't I just go and become a full-time NHS clinician rather than mixed? So that was quite a big dilemma. People were trying to persuade me to to take full-time consultant jobs, you know, at hospitals that they wanted me to go. But I was determined to try and stick it out and get an intermediate fellowship. Good for you. You know, it was it worked out in the end. But it's and again, I think it goes back to what you're saying. If you really want to do something, you know, give it your best shot. It may not work out, but if you can give it a go, don't just give up before you start. Um, But it was a pretty stressful year, I must admit, or maybe a bit longer trying to get an intermediate fellowship. I can imagine. Um, And yeah, as well for uh, talking about your PhD, um, changing uh, um, changing the direction of the research after your first year there's there must be so many people out there and of course listening to this podcast who are uh, maybe mid phd they find that what they're doing isn't you know quite working they think maybe it'll be better go in a, in a different direction so if if you um if you could speak directly to these people would you tell them to stick with what has generally like not worked in the hope that it would uh, it would change in future or do you think that 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 change in tact is, is, a, is a better approach? I think it's very individualist. I, the first thing to say is that at the end of most first years of your PhD, you don't have much data. So mm. the project can actually be going very nicely, but you don't actually have a lot of data at the end of the first year. And then certainly in the second half of the PhD, you accumulate more. But actually, we'd done what we didn't we intended to do, and it had worked, and we had generated a load of monoclonals. So... That made the decision a little bit easier because it suggested that our approach to the, uh, not the problem, our our approach to the challenge worked, but actually was never going to answer the question. So it made that decision to change a bit easy, more easy. But I think if you're enjoying your project, don't panic that the data's wrong, uh, you know, that you've Mm. not got enough data. But if you are concerned about the direction of the project, then definitely speak to the supervisor earlier rather than later and just, you know, get their advice and just see, you know, are they happy with how it's going? Because both um, my supervisor and I realised that probably we needed to change tack. So again, that made the decision uh, easier, really. Hmm. Fair enough. Um, what was the best piece of advice that somebody ever gave to you? I think um, I had lots of good advice. And I think, you know, you anybody um, always look for good advice from people because you um, Mm. it really makes a difference Um, but I think well this is perhaps a little bit more focused for a clinical academic but 
Don't get bogged down into one thing. Don't, you know, as you get a a little bit more senior, don't put all your eggs in one basket. So, for example, as as a clinical academic, you can you can do full time clinical medicine as a clinician. But, Mm -hmm. you know, it's going to be struggle to do that for 40 years without having some other interests. Now, that might be research. It might be management. It might be private practice, it might be charity work, but just have a number of different things. And if you're a scientist, you know, you may be really passionate about one particular area and one particular project, but also think you've got to be developing other areas because, and you know, I don't mean become unfocused, but you can, you can be scooped in one area or areas come to a natural conclusion and you want to keep developing and, and pushing out into different novel areas. So I think... Yeah. You know, I think there's a, a very fine line between being too siloed, being too unfocused, and in the middle there's a road where you have a portfolio of work. And it's not easy to find that and keep on that track. It's certainly very tough. I think um, uh, something that's probably also important to note is this is quite topical nowadays, but it's the interdisciplinary nature of research. Um, I'm not exactly sure how, how much of a thing this is in, in clinical medicine, clinical academic medicine, but... Um, you know, exposing yourself to different environments and, you know, like, like you were saying, not sort of like, you know, just staying in, in, in this sort of like narrow area, you're exposed to different ways of thinking. And, you know, for instance, chemists think in a very different way to biologists do about a problem. And, you know, they'll, they'll try to uh, solve uh, the problem with it, with a different approach. So I think it's, yeah, it's, 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 you know, this is this something just that I've learned, um, like throughout doing my PhD, as you know, I do uh, chemistry, biology, bioengineering sort of stuff. Yeah. But yeah. This idea about going in different areas. Um, yeah. I think absolutely fantastic. You I really think it's important and it's become really important in medicine because, yeah. you know, we have what, what we call multidisciplinary meetings to discuss complex patients because for the reasons that you say you know the radiologist will give a different input to the neurologist to the rheumatologist to the chest physician and you know it's it's really important to have multidisciplinary input if you can so yeah I think I think that's a good thing then the other thing is not to take things too personally and this is incredibly difficult you know when you you've got to be prepared for rejection papers grants and it's it's it really easy to get into this frame of mind that it's a personal attack on you as the author or but mm. actually it's never that well and that's not never nothing's never say never but 99% <laughs> of the cases it's not and you know I, I have sounds friends, like a bad experience though. yeah yeah <laughs> I, I've had friends who are editors of journals who've been confronted by irate authors saying I know Dr X Y or Z you know um referee that paper and and all of these editors told me that that 99 percent of the time the person's wrong you think it's dr a but actually it rarely is and usually it's their mate you know they think it's the last person it would have been so never take things personally you've, you've got to get over it and just pick yourself up and go again um yeah, which is easier sure. said than done but it's it is important <laughs> as is most most things right like do a phd very very easy to say, right? um, okay um, what then has been the uh, we, we sort of discussed this a little bit before but what's been the the, the highlight of your career the, the the memory that sticks out the most as, as the yeah the I think the real highlight has you know in in looking at different areas has been sort of um, thinking I mean two things really one hoping and thinking that I probably had some impact on patient care in the present time but also in the future so improving the lot for people albeit with relatively rare diseases so I think that's been a highlight and still is that you can actually get often very young people very sick coming to you Mm. and then um, really making them better improving their well-being their outlook their long-term future and sort of getting their response back you know is very rewarding and then being recognized by my colleagues in 2018 um, with an with a national rheumatology award the Hebiden medal and oration so that was a big day for me oh well congratulations I didn't know about this award so yeah massive. so that was really nice you know when you're recognized by your colleagues um, then you know it, it's very humbling so I, so that was a big thing for me as well I think yeah Mm. So from from the highs of your career, let's go to the opposite end of the scale. And um, would you mind sharing what the what the hardest decision of your career was? 
Certainly not going to America was a very hard decision mm. because, you know, this was a, a fantastic opportunity at Harvard and Brigham and Women's Hospital. You know, it's not something that comes along very often. So I think that was probably the, the hardest, um, hardest thing, mm. sort of personal career thing. Um, you know, there were other sort of difficult decisions. I, you know, I was trying, I toyed between oncology and rheumatology. You know, because um, okay. very early on, Charing Cross Hospital was very strong in oncology, so that was was difficult, I think. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think those are probably the main hard decisions. They they yeah, they seem like really really tough decisions for sure. Yeah. Um, so okay, this is uh, a question again. I'm very interested in hearing your your answer for because you're an incredibly busy man. You know, you run a research group, you, you run a, um, uh, your own clinic in the hospital. So how do you balance your time? And what then would your, would your top work life balance advice be to people who are either trying to be clinical academics, such as yourself, or just, or just, or just in general? How do you do it? Yeah, it's very difficult. I think um, I don't. I think there's. It's always been a worry for me that if you're a clinical academic, you end up as not a very good doctor, not a very good teacher, and not a very good researcher. Um, so that's always a worry, and you're running around trying to fit them all in, yeah. like a jack of all trades. Kind yeah, of you, and, and that is a challenge. Um, and I think um, trying to, I think is 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 not to get too stressed by each or one of them. You know, you can't expect everything to be going well all at mm. once I think you've got to protect some time so what I, I mean this was a decision I made on advice well before we all got locked down at home but once I become a PI somebody said to me look what you want to do is take one day each week that you're going to basically work from home and do writing and thinking and and that was one of the best bits of advice I've had so I protect one day it's the same day each week I mean you know of course not everyone's fortunate enough to be able to do that but that was really good. And, you know, I, I really use that day properly. So it's compartmentalization, I think. I think in the last couple of years, I've been lucky enough to have some PA support. And I'm still learning how to optimize the use of that. But that's been a huge difference as well. It's quite difficult handing over your diary and things to someone else. <laughs> but actually, they turn out to be much better at it than, than you are. Yeah, but well, that's it. You know, you've got to remember that you, as well. You, I know you're incredibly busy now. You're having, you know, all of these commitments, um, which is why I'm also very grateful. Given, you know, you gave up your time for for this podcast, but you know, you you made it to professor without a PA. Yeah, so, you know. no, I only got a PA. Yeah, and and then <laughs> I, I keep taking on things. So, and I think should I really be doing this? But. Um, it's amazing what you can cope with. And I think the thing is not being frightened to say no, uh, which I'm not very good at, but that's one thing. Not being frightened to ask for help, which is mm. absolutely critical in clinical medicine, but I think also in every aspect. Don't be frightened yeah. to say to someone, look, do you know, actually, I'm getting a little bit out of my depth here. Can, mm. you know, what's your advice? You know, how would you do it? And, you know, then if you've got good people around you, working with you, then give them some responsibility and delegate to them. You know, I think it's it's a fatal if you think you're the only person who can do anything well and that everybody else is rubbish. You know, that's a massive mistake. Yeah. So if you've got good people, give them a chance. Give them a chance yeah. to delegate, take on responsibility, do stuff mm. with them. Um, and one, it's very rewarding. And actually, two, usually they turn out to be better at it than you were anyway. <laughs> um, so it's fine. I, I, yeah. I had a very good, I went to a festrift not that long ago. And the person who it was for um, said that one of their mantras during their very senior career had been never be fr to, never be frightened to appoint someone brighter or more able than yourself. And, uh, they said that had given them a successful career, <laughs> which I thought was an excellent, an excellent point. Because some people are, you know, they're frightened of, of bright people, but that's fatal. No, it's true. You should you should really empower people. I think it comes from good mentorship as well, like being able to, um, you know, uh, I, I'm uh, someone who, who tries to um, mentor people younger than me, but I also look up to other people for that mentorship. And, it, you know, you, you select the people who are who are going to be on your side, who are going to help you and mentor you. And yeah, that's 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 the definitely the way for it. Mm. And, you know, there's you know obviously you know obviously come ac across things that you don't enjoy doing or are an absolute pain but then i always think to myself well 
you know, we're jolly lucky, particularly these days, to be in jobs, you know, where we've got this sort of stuff. So, you know, and lots to do and, you know, we're not having to do jobs that we hate. And, you know, that's, been, you know, it's been a real blessing because, you know, most of the people in the world don't enjoy their jobs. And I think we tend to forget that. Um, so I think we, you know, it's always worth remembering that one's in a very fortunate position. Okay. So, so final, final question. question. Um, so, so you're somebody, somebody who gives um, presentations a lot. You're somebody who, you know, you're invited to speak at uh, many different, um, many different, different symposia, symposia and etc. Et well, there, there must have been, been a point where um, you were um, maybe not so uh, experienced and perhaps you suffered from common issues including imposter syndrome or um, you know, uh, anxiety about public speaking. Yeah. So do you have any advice on, on how you, if you did suffer from these, um, how did you uh, overcome those challenges? Yeah, I mean, it re- I definitely did. So I remember the first time I was invited to give a, a talk was at the... Um, it was called, I think it was called the Hebberton Society. It's now the British Society of Rheumatology. It was in okay. Bristol when I was a medical student. So I'd done this BSc project and it had got a short presentation at this meeting. So it was a sort of national meeting. So I was still a medical student. So I had to go and ask the surgeon whose firm I was on at the time whether I could have the day off to go to Bristol. Whereupon, I think he probably swore, but I may be embellishing it. But he, anyway, he said something like, why the hell do you want to be wasting your time doing that? Um, and I, so I stuck to my guns, but I, I can remember driving down to Bristol in this little mini that I had and getting there. I was absolutely petrified. And then I had a friend there who was a bit older than me, was winding me up, you know, saying, oh, you know, there's a fierce professor in the front row who we all knew. He'll, he'll have a go at you. And he was really giving me a bit of that. And I can still remember standing behind the dais, you know, as you stand on the stage. behind, And I could not stop my right knee shaking. I, I, could, I sort of, nobody else could see it, but I thought the whole audience could see it. And I was worried it would bang against the dais, you know. But anyway, I got through it and said professor did get up to ask me the first question, but actually was extremely nice to me. And, you know, and I suddenly thought, actually, maybe this is not as bad as uh, I thought it would. <laughs> it certainly wasn't as bad as having to be... Um, a couple of years later, I had to do the changing the slides. You guys won't remember slides, but you used to have to go oh. with your talk with a, a carousel with your 10 um, slides to drop into the carousel to give oh, your wow. talk. <laughs> I mean, you had to prepare them two weeks in advance and you had to photograph them. You had to get them back from the, you know, the developer. So you'd go along with wow. your little box. You'd give them over to some bloke who would then present your talk from the, you know, this. Up. So I got roped in as a medical student at Kensington Town Hall to be the person who was changing the slides. And I managed to cock, cock up a number of people's talks as they got jammed in the slide. So that was more nerve wracking that that would happen to you than giving the talk itself. But I definitely had imposter syndrome as well. You, th- you know, I remember yeah. being, you get invited to things, giving these talks and you think, oh no. Yeah, and then you recognise people in the audience. You think, oh, gosh, they've come all the way to listen to me. You know, they'll think mm. I'm some... But you, you get over it. And, I, you know, never... Ne- in 99% of the time, people, are, you know, are, are really keen to support the speaker. You know, everyone's been there and done it themselves. And so I would never turn down the opportunity if I was a junior scientist. If someone asks you to give a talk, even if you think, oh, I'd, I'm going to frighten me to death, go and do it. Yeah. Because the only way you get better at it is is doing it and get people to, you know, practice your talk with people first and time it. The thing I was taught is you've got to time your talk. Don't run over time because you're unprepared. Mm. Um, you know, just practice your talk, time it, know what you want to say. And then once you've stood up there, you may as well speak up loudly and say what you're going to say. Um, there's no point if it's if it's a load of rubbish it's going to be a load of rubbish if you whisper it or if you shout it (laughs) so it's better to look confident you get away with a lot if you look confident Um, you do you do but you're right you just have to you know shoot your shot really don't you Uh, if it if if it if it fails it fails but if um yeah the, the worst thing that can can happen and uh, is, is, is probably that the, the anxiety overcomes you mid-talk, which happened to me like when I was very uh, very early on. Like, fortunately, it, was, it wasn't in front of an audience. It was in front of um, people who I was practicing with. But this is where, again, the preparation aspect... It is really key. does. Absolutely key. The more you practice. It's the same for interviews. You know, if you've got an interview for something you really want, have a mock interview with people. Do some practice. And, you know, if you're going to a big meeting and you're giving a talk, there's nothing to stop you taking a few prompt cards or some prompts or put it on the slides, you know, 
And if you do lose your way, you can just look down and, and have a stimulus. Because it's happened to all of us at some point or another. You suddenly have a complete blank about what you're going to say about the next slide. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the worst thing. And then you've got all these eyes piercing you, staring, and you're like, oh, no, I can't remember. And you're like, um, um. <laughs> yeah, not great. So thank you very much for everything so far, Justin. Um, could you please tell us about what your passions outside of science are? So what do you like to do in your leisure time? So I guess my real passion for years was sport. I always loved sport, playing sport. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, at school I played cricket, rugby and hockey. But um, I got to medical school and realised that rugby, once you've left school, um, is, you know, particularly in those days, was just involved going out to... A, you know, play against, I don't know, Milton Keynes' second team, where there'd be a load of 35-year-old blokes wanting to kick the hell out of you. So I carried on playing hockey and cricket, which I loved. I played, I think, well, when I, I, I played club cricket oh, for a good number of years, and then I played club hockey until um, I was how old? Um, until I was nearly 50, I guess. Um, oh, wow. I okay. really okay. enjoyed that. I mean, I went down the teams, as you do, you know, got into the veterans. <laughs> but yeah, that was a real... Team, team Z. Z. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But I really loved it. And eventually I, my hip packed up and I had to have a hip replacement, which is probably because I played on too long. So I really enjoyed sport. Uh, I still enjoy watching sport and doing stuff. Mm -hmm. um, my grandfather taught me to fly fish when I was about five, I think. So oh, I've always okay. been keen on wildlife and the outdoors and going fly fishing in the river. So I do that still a lot. Um, and I've always had this passion for African wildlife and photography, Af wildlife photography. So I do that. And of course, these days we can't travel, but... Um, no, but you must have got a good photo album somewhere stashed away. Yeah, I've been to Africa. I've been lucky enough to go on numerous trips over the years. Mm -hmm. um, and I like... Um, you know, going to bush camps and going walking uh, in the African bush, not on my own, but with, you know, a proper, gu <laughs> a proper guide. Um, and I really enjoy that. So that, I particularly like the wilderness, you know, and, and the outdoors. So that's always yeah. good. So yeah. I guess those, yeah, I guess those are the, uh, are my main sort of uh, particular passions probably. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so are you a passionate advocate for anything? Well, I think increasingly, like everybody else, I'm beginning to recognise the importance of climate change and what, that we've got to do something mm -hmm. about it. I don't, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't pretend to be knowledgeable about it. I'm lucky enough to have a brother-in-law who works in renewable energy, so he keeps me up to speed. <laughs> so I think, and you know, I know um, the younger members of our family are very passionate about this for obvious reasons, because it's their future. So I think I'm, I'm particularly passionate about that. I'm particularly passionate about access to health care. Uh, mm -hmm. across the world I mean so you know giving equal access to healthcare which I realize is a, is a, a difficult aspiration but I hope maybe mm -hmm. when I retire you know might be able to go and do some stuff in an African medical school perhaps you know a bit of teaching and stuff to try and roll that out so I th um, I'm particularly passionate about that so mm. yeah yeah I think that's um that's brilliant um especially with the access to healthcare thing um how how much do you think um, technology is going to weigh into access to healthcare? Because everybody pr practically has access to a smartphone now. Yeah. Um, so, do you think that the future of um, of of, uh, of of medicine is going to be mobile based health, and that will help make it more accessible? I think absolutely. I've got colleagues here at Imperial who work a lot on remote monitoring and remote healthcare, and okay. you know, for example, looking at um, the treatment of TB around the world, you can. Um, you can really improve compliance with anti-TB medication by empowering people to have a smartphone. Previously, they'd have to go along, you know, this is, I'm talking in rural India, perhaps, or Africa, mm -hmm. you'd have to go along to register, pick up your tablet and register that you've taken it in, you know, a little store, maybe in a little village, so that everybody knew that you had TB, you know, so any privacy. But now they've run out things with smartwatches and smartphones where people mm. can photograph themselves taking the tablet and do it in their own home. And it's hugely increased compliance and access. They can be monitored, you know, for heart conditions, all sorts of stuff. So I think, yeah, and, and across Africa, most people have smartphones. You know, a lot of people do. They're much... 
it's it's a very you know it's a much cheaper way of doing stuff and they do all their banking on it and things so I think yeah. remote monitoring and you know really gives people access to things that they would never have had before uh, and I think AI and machine learning and pattern recognition will, will drive all yeah. of this so you've just read my mind this was the exact question I just wanted to ask you um, how do you think that uh, yeah uh, it, so I think there's a I can't remember who it is at Imperial now but they've developed the AI program that can see um, like uh, it scans lung um, x-rays and it can look for, uh, for for tumors so how do you think that this is going to change the role of a doctor uh, of a clinician I think it won't you know it won't it'll, it'll be more um, increase work and increase opportunity because you know if you are as, as, as we were saying in a rural uh, hospital for example all you need is for someone to be able to take the imaging. So providing you've got a CT scanner, which are not expensive now, as long as somebody can run that image, they then can send them remotely, either to an AI type program or remotely mm. to a doctor sat in Sydney, for example, if you're in the Australian bush or wherever, to interpret mm. the imaging. And you, know, you can run things through uh, AI and get rapid, you know, is this a serious problem, a minor problem or a middling problem? So I think it will alter the, uh, the role of a doctor it'll just give you more information and more accurate information but you know we've got yeah. a long way to go because these are very complex images and so the vasculature is a good example you can't do an ai assessment of the vasculature at the moment you might be able to do the carotid artery or the coronary artery but it's um, a lot more work in that arena but it's it's hugely going to empower people around the world to get much better access to healthcare. all of this type of thing so I don't think we should be frightened of it. I don't, certainly don't think doctors should be frightened of it. In fact, the opposite. Yeah, so this is, the, this is the thing, isn't it? I suppose when the first kind of industrial revolution came along, everyone was like, oh, these factories are going to take all of our jobs. But they actually ended up increasing output and, you know, making different types of jobs. So uh, I suppose, I mean, it's a tough question, but could you, could you potentially forecast what would happen to, uh, to the, again, the role of a doctor when, you know, 50 years time what do you what, how, how do you think it's uh, well it's I, you know, I think it might it you know it might free up doctors time to spend on other things because at the moment doctors in many countries including our own are far too stretched but say mm. for example one has diabetes and you need to have your your regular diabetic eye check you could go in you could have your you know the machine would take your um images and then AI programs would say you know could it could be rapidly run through an AI program saying normal minor abnormality recheck in a year slightly less than a minor app recheck in six months or see the doctor so suddenly you've you know you've taken away potentially half of the face-to-face -face appointments for that doctor so then they can spend more time on the people with serious disease um, yeah. and you know I can really see it freeing up time because at the moment you know, p patients are whisked in and out too quickly, in my view. We've gone too far and we miss things because we don't have the time to spend with them. Whereas, in fact, a lot of the time you're spending the same amount of time with someone who's not got much wrong with them as you are with someone who's really got a lot wrong with them. And so I think a lot of that part of the work will be taken away from hospitals, uh, allowing hospitals to focus on, you know, earlier care, more intensive care, better monitoring of the people who really need it. Um, so I think that's how it'll change. I think it'll help surgeons hugely as well. Already it is. You know, the accuracy. How? Well, it won't, it won't change their work in the sense that they won't have to do the operation, but it'll improve the accuracy of what they're doing. Mm. So, you know, for example, things like the eye knife that was discovered here that will detect cancer very clearly. You know, you can get a very tight margin around a tumour. Um, you, can, you can focus in much more on, on very precise areas. And that's mm. the same with directing radiotherapy. You know, it's, it, it'll be much, much tighter, so you don't get a lot of bystander tissue injury and things. So, so, so another question then, uh, just, uh, do you think that robotics has a part to play in surgery? So particularly when you, you mentioned the eye knife, um, could a robot ever replace a surgeon? Yeah, I guess they probably could. Um, you know, for, it depends obviously what type of operation you're dealing with. But, yeah. you know, for example, removing an appendix where or removing uh, an uninflamed but a gallbladder with stones and things like that, 
where you know not a lot of decision making has to be done during the procedure yeah. then yes i can and 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 also you know maybe um removing a lot of the sort of day case surgery that's done you know removing small lesions that need to be sent to the lab to check you know superficial skin cancers or that type of thing yeah definitely I, I find robotics a fascinating area because again it's like it's like the whole factory industrial revolution thing right like a, a robot can just go 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 it doesn't need it maybe it needs to be plugged in to recharge or something but you know it can just you know con- continually churn out patients like all through the night whereas um yeah h- humans can get tired and I, I think that this would also be something that would really um you know help with the accessibility to healthcare so that poorer nations obviously i'm sure at first the price of one of these like, surgery robots could be incredibly high but you know if um if, if the cost was down so much then the access to healthcare again would be um would be would be really interesting and this this kind of links back to what we were saying before as well about the boundaries are between different disciplines and how being interdisciplinary is absolutely crucial because there's no way that a robot can learn how to do a, a surgery or there's no way these 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 guys who did the ai um the, the scans that fed into the ai software they can't learn to do that without the expertise that's that's currently there so i think there's a lot of this uh scope for the the, the combination of different areas of medicine of science and technology all it's an incredibly exciting time yeah. in, in in my view yeah well that's right and you know you could be again in remote medicine if you have a robot in a small hospital remotely providing there's a general surgeon there who can get access and put the robot in the right place then someone miles away can actually operate the robot and do the, the fine part oh, of the course. disease yeah, yeah, yeah. so i think that's already beginning to happen um, oh, really? you know, so one surgeon can actually operate on numerous patients around the place rather than these patients having to all try and get to them. You know, wow. that make it, will make a massive difference, I think, and particularly in life saving surgery, you know, with, after injury or bleeding and things like that. Um, I mean, not to be facetious, but it almost seems like it'll be a little bit of a, a video game almost. Like, you know, if you sat, you know, with five yeah. different screens in front of you, just sort of like playing this, it, it could almost... I think like those sort of skills, a lot of the skills of the surgeon now, and I'm not a surgeon, as you know, but, you know, are mm. literally, you know, you've got your eyes to a huge um, headset and you're you're yeah. doing, doing things remotely with a fine um, instruments and uh, it's incredible. It's true. Yeah, the dexterity needed uh, for surgeons is, is it's yeah it's you, you really have to have like you know this fine motor control over your over your hands and people who, you know I I'm not someone who who enjoys uh, gaming particularly I, I I do from time to time but you know these the, these professional gamers as a, just as an example the the fine control that they have is and of course that can allow you as well these three dimensional models now to practice operations in three D mm-hmm. with virtual reality. And, you know, the training opportunities are massive without actually having to do make the mistakes on a patient. You know, you can make it in the model a bit like flying. You know, they do all these simulators, <laughs> don't they? And yeah, I think it's a simulation. Yeah. yeah exactly. uh, you know, the, the, you, you don't get the same resistance to the tissue. So I can understand why it's not perfect, mm. but it's, it's a good start. So the final thoughts, let's um, just... Uh, wrapping up this interview it's been an uh, an honor to to interview you like this justin i've really appreciated all of the answers and responses that you've that you've given so far so i'd like to just uh ask you a few final quick fire questions mm. um what would your advice be to young people right now like everyone is pretty uh badly affected by the pandemic everyone is is well aware of this but there's there's being aware of it and then there's figuring out what to actually do um you know, put yourselves put you put yourself in the shoes of, of of a younger person. What what you know? What advice would you would you give? So I think the main thing I'd say is hold your nerve. You know, the vaccines mm-hmm. the vaccines are looking extremely effective. I'm not saying there won't be hiccups along the way, but things will return to normal before too long. So the main thing is to not despair. Still get as higher and as good a qualifications as you can. If you can't make progress in your career path for a year or two don't panic you know do another job earn some money in whichever way you can but hold on to the dreams of what you want to do because it will come around again and as i was saying earlier when you're 20 you think i've got to be there by 25 and i've got to be there when i'm 27 in reality that's not the case you suddenly find i say to the registrars you know don't rush to be a consultant because you're going to have plenty of time as a consultant 
you know, get properly trained, do a few other things. So I think hold your nerve. Um, this wretched virus it will be behind us in the next two or three years completely, and things will go back to normal much before then. Um, hopefully this summer, yeah. We'll see. Hopefully this summer, you know, and if the variants don't prove a problem or if we need a booster, then we need a booster. So, yeah. you know, I think hold on to your, yeah, don't give up. Don't change plans when you really don't want to. And always set your goals high. I mean, you know, have confidence in yourself, I think is the main thing. But be prepared to change tack if you if you need to. Yeah. So this is now uh, kind of what we've already touched upon, but perhaps you wanted to expand on your previous answers or, or go in a completely different direction. But which emerging trend do you see as having the greatest potential to affect change? Um, it could be in science in general, uh, specifically in medicine, um, a scientific technique that you think is... Um, is, is, is really going to change the world. Um, yeah, what, what do you think? So I think I've always been very interested in pathogenesis of disease, particularly rheumatic mm -hmm. diseases, which we don't understand well. So I do think, you know, there's always trends in science, but I do think the power of single cell sequencing okay. um, and really drilling down on um, signaling pathways um, is the other area that will, and high, in high throughput, is the way in which we can really begin to not only understand disease, but also um, develop targeted therapies. Because actually a lot of the therapies we use are very broad. Um, and I think we need to have much, you know, we now do have some biologic th therapies. They are much more effective and they're much less toxic. Mm -hmm. So that's one area. I think another big challenge is the, is the resistance, bacterial resistance. I think that is potentially a major problem. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And, you know, throwing, we've thrown around antibodies all over the world in all sorts of arenas. So I think that is a big concern. I think it's not being addressed, really, either, bacterial resistance. You know, I mean, I'm not sure about you, but I've not really been exposed to much research on, um, on uh, bacterial, you know, new antimicrobials. No, it's proving really difficult, I understand, to develop new antimicrobials. And the last <clears throat> CMO, um, Dame Sally Davis, she was pushing that hard when she was in post, Chief okay. Medical Officer. Um, so I think that's a major challenge for society going forward. Um, I think I've become, having um, last weekend been in um, an electric car, I've been in, I must have been in, in a purely electric car and not just, you know, it, it was, it was a golf, but it was an electric golf. And I thought, my God, this car is absolutely fantastic. You know, <laughs> so suddenly the reality of this came home to me that actually you can have a very comfortable journey in albeit relatively limited distances still. So I think that's going to make a massive difference. Uh, renewal, uh, renewable energies in the next decade, we're going to be changing things hugely in, in that arena. Um, and then I think, you know, the, 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 the dangers, but also the benefits of genomic analysis. So uh, ultimately, if we want to, we are going to be able to predict people who are at serious risk of particular illnesses. Now, that may or may not be a good thing because, mm -hmm. you know, you've got to ha you've got to be able to know how to treat them before you want to know that you're at risk of them. If there's no treatment for an illness, why would you want to know 20 years earlier? And you've got to keep it away from insurance companies or you've got to keep that. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. you know, we go through, we take people, for example, with rheumatoid arthritis and we give them drug A, drug B, drug C, drug D in an order. Yep. You know, actually, maybe with proper genomic analysis, we'd be able to say, well, actually, these, this third will respond to A. Yeah. but not to B, and these all respond to C and not to D. So we'll save a huge amount of money. We'll improve the, the lot for the patient because they get the right drug up front. So I think pharmacogenomics is going to have a huge impact. Um, and that'll bring the cost of drugs down, and it'll, it'll be available then. They'll be available more widely around the world, I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so then, very final question. If you could do it all over again, what would you keep the same, and then what would you, what would you change? I think I would do more work abroad. I think I'd do more scientific training, either abroad or in other labs. I think I was very lucky to move through quite quickly from PhD to becoming a senior fellow. And in fact, in hindsight, I think more science training would have been a massive benefit. So mm. I think, you know, the opportunity to go to Harvard or to go to a different big lab in um, the UK or in Europe, 
would have been a real advantage. So I think, you know, it's not always possible. You know, one can't just move one's family around the world saying, oh, this is what I want to do. The rest of you are just going to have to come along. That's not how it works. But that, I think, I might have done. Um, More proper, what I call proper scientific training would have been a good thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, what else would I have changed? I mean, I'm very happy with the choices I made, so I wouldn't change a lot. I was going to say, like, you know, you you, you mentioned uh, this Harvard opportunity. You know, anybody who gets the opportunity to go for Harvard, you know, that's, yeah, you you jump at it, right? But you were also able to to get that clinical post a couple of years earlier than uh, than than would have. Uh, you, you, who knows if you would have gone for Harvard for more scientific training? You could have been waiting another few more years uh, for the same post to come up. So, it, exactly, it, 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 yeah, it doesn't. It's really and, you know, I'm lucky enough to be able to be able to combine scientific research now with a clinical interest that I really enjoy. And you know, I see patients from all over the UK. So you know, that's a huge bonus and privilege to be able to see people and and try and help them so yeah and I think maybe I would have worked a bit harder and listened a bit more when uh, I was training (laughs) like everybody else Um, but um, and you know I would have definitely spent more time having a bit of fun as well Uh, you know and and worried about things less and thought you know I'm going to go I'm just not going to work for two weeks I'm going to take a bit of time off and go abroad and use more of my holiday entitlement uh, which is definitely a mistake I've made over the years, not using enough of that. But um, uh, you always, I always come yeah. back much better when I've been on holiday. But then I worry, oh, you know, I haven't got time to go away on holiday, which is always nonsense. No, you're right. You've got to make this time for it. And I think, if if anything, that's kind of what the pandemic showed. Um, that you know, the the work. I mean, if 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 people didn't know this already, um, the work is always going to be there. You're always going to be. Uh, there's always going to be another deadline. There's always going to be this and the other. And if you don't take that little bit of time for yourself, um, then it's it's a monotonous existence. Um, like uh, not you know all work and no play. But if you enjoy your work, like you know both you and I do, it's yeah, it's not so bad. But no. But definitely making time for for holidays, being being re- prepared uh, to, you know, just recharge your batteries. It's, yeah, crucially, crucially, crucially important. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. Okay. Well, on that note, thank you very much for all of your time today. Um, really, really appreciate it. No, it's really nice to do it, Alex. Thanks very much for inviting me. It's great. Well, there we have it. That is what it's like to be a clinical academic. I really can't thank Justin enough for taking the time out of his day to do this interview. He gave such fantastic advice and such brilliant research stories, particularly about the radioactive pigs. The next episode is going to be released on the 21st of July and will feature Dr. Garrick Wilson, where we'll talk all about how to train the next generation of scientists. In the meantime, please make sure to keep subscribing and following us on Twitter and YouTube and rate us on your podcast platform as this helps us out a huge deal with metrics and it'll be very much appreciated. Until next time.